welcome to all our panelists welcome to all our participants today we are good morning good evening good afternoon wherever you are thank you so much for joining us today we have a very very interesting event planned today and we're so excited to have four experts with us i will briefly begin by introducing the organizers of this event i begin with the earth system governance project which is a global interdisciplinary research network which is advancing knowledge at the interface between global environmental change and governance the project aims to explore political solutions and novel and more effective governance systems to cope with global environmental change the network connects and mobilizes scholars from the social sciences and humanities working from local to global scales by the end of 2020 the south south 2022 the south south initiative was established by the earth system governance project with the goal of strengthening the esg network in the global south promoting exchange between global south scholars and further building a community of scholarship on regionally relevant research topics esg has been doing wonderful work and we are so honored to be co-hosting this event with the earth system governance project the indo pacific circle uh, which i am representing here today along with my colleague amba is a curated network of early and mid career, career scholars from the indo pacific who are engaged in shaping the emergent narratives of the region the indo pacific circle has three main objectives where we're looking to network and build a community where we're looking to co create and define the indo pacific and most importantly amplify voices from the region around the globe our flagship journal is the indo pacific review which is a peer reviewed journal published twice a year in english which is dedicated to advancing our understanding of the dynamic and evolving landscape of the indo pacific region in line with the mandate of the indo pacific circle the journal seeks to contribute to a regionally owned reimagination of the indo pacific by encouraging and highlighting forward creative and critical views on contemporary conceptions and issues emerging from the region I am delighted to share with all of you that our upcoming publication is on building a sustainable Indo-Pacific, and we are so honored to have Dr. Jairam and Ms. Morrison contribute to the journal. This journal, uh, this this issue specifically, is looking at the challenge of sustainability and climate-related challenges in the Indo-Pacific, and we are trying to explore the various social, human, economic, and environmental dimensions of sustainability, and explore the various pathways. as to how can we build a more sustainability sustainable region in doing so we encouraged broader definitions of sustainability which touch on the different environmental state level and human implications of this term so the key issues that we've covered are gender parity and sustainable innovation in the region impact of deep sea mining in pacific islands south south cooperation for sustainability transitions with reference to palm oil in the region and different climate governance approaches in the sub regions of the indo pacific and also how to harness the blue economy potential of the region the aim of this webinar is to bring four experts together to discuss this very very important theme of why building a sustainable indo pacific is very very necessary at this moment and we are so honored to have our experts join us um they do have a very very long bio and i apologize in advance if i'm cutting it short but that is in the interest of time and so that our panelists get the most amount of time to speak on their topics but i'll begin by quick introductions following which i will ask the panelists to take over and before i go into the introductions a quick uh, description the a description of the format of how we're going about this where each speaker will be given the first 10 minutes for opening remarks following which we'll have a moderated discussion on this theme and then we'll have a q and a a discussion all participants are engaged are encouraged to engage actively please ask your questions over the chat box and we will address them and uh, again housekeeping rules please do stay on mute and uh, raise your hands if you have any queries and please do not interrupt any of the participants or uh, panelists when they are speaking so first we have uh, dr jayaram who is a research fellow at center mark block and guest researcher at free university berlin under the alexander von humboldt foundation's international climate protection fellowship for postdocs 2020 2020 2022 2023 She is also an assistant professor at the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations and co-coordinator for the Center for Climate Studies at Manipal Academy for Higher Education, Karnataka. 
She's a research fellow at the Earth System Governance, a member of Climate Security Experts Network, a member of Planet Politics Institute, and a member of the Indo-Pacific Circle. We also have with us Dr. Anisa Triyanthi. Uh, Dr. Anisa Triyanthi is an assistant professor of disaster and climate risk governance for sustainability at the Environmental Governance Group, Copernicus Institute of Sustainable Development, Utrecht University. She holds a PhD in coastal disaster uh, risk governance. Her research focuses on addressing water-related disasters in coastal and delta regions, especially in the Asian region. She's also one of the conveners of the ESG Asia Pacific Group. We also have with us uh, Ms. Elizabeth Morrison, who is a researcher in the Democracy and Accountability Program. Her interests in climate integrity and social license are, formed, uh, are informed by her multidisciplinary background in research, journalism, and community organizing. During her time as an Anne Cantor Young Woman Environmentalist Fellow, she contributed to the Democracy and Accountability Program in a number of capacities, including research, data analysis, and communication. Finally, we have with us Dr. Hong Wen Gwen. I apologize, doctor, if I got your name wrong, uh, but uh, please, please correct me if I got the pronunciation wrong. But uh, he is currently an associate professor at the Vietnam National University, Ho Chi Minh City. He's, a le he's leading a newly established Institute for Circular Economy Development, Institute for Environmental and Resources. He has a special interest in solving environmental related issues based on inter-transdisciplinary study and by a strong partnership among academia, industry, and government. He has been working in environmental hydro hydrology in Southern Vietnam over the past 15 years and has expanded his expertise in other disciplines, which include, but are not limited to, climate change adaptation, mitigation, circular economy, socio-ecological systems, and sustainability sciences. So a very, very warm welcome to all our panelists. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really looking forward to a very engaging discussion today. Uh, with that, if I may request Dr. Jairam to begin. Uh, Dr. Jairam, you have 10 minutes. I will give you a quick indica indication towards the eight minute mark. Um, and with that, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rushali. And I'm very glad to be here uh, with uh, Anisa Hong and Elizabeth. And uh, yeah, and I'm also happy to have contributed to this uh, journal issue on building sustainability in the Indo-Pacific. And, and I'm also happy to be, you know, representing both Indo-Pacific Circle and the Earth System Governance uh, in, this, in this event. Uh, so what I'm going to be speaking about in this uh, uh, webinar is, is actually on the topic that I contributed uh, to the journal issue itself. Um, I hope my slides are visible. Yeah, so, yes. uh, so the topic that I, I mean, the theme, broader theme that I, uh, uh, that I uh, worked on was about the just energy transitions in the Indo-Pacific case for a gender transformative agenda. And I think this is one of the kind of less explored areas when we talk about Indo-Pacific, uh, you know, strategies and Indo-Pacific policies, cooperation on even when it comes to climate change related issues, Gender doesn't really come up a lot in some of these discussions, so it's. I thought this is an important issue to flag and also talk about. Uh, you know, in terms of building, um, building the kind of knowledge that we need, and also in terms of uh, enhancing cooperation on uh, on on creating a gender transformative agenda for Indo-Pacific uh, um, cooperation and strategy on climate change specifically. And I, I would also like to acknowledge that this is the topic that I've been working on, not necessarily just the Indo-Pacific, but broadly about climate uh, and gender or the role of gender in intergovernmental processes on climate change under the fellowship that I'm currently pursuing here in Berlin with the International Climate Protection Fellowship. And I would also like to acknowledge my co-author, uh, Kurnika uh, Bhattacharji, who is actually my former student and now she is in University of Sussex. Um, so she has also contributed to this article, and I think she is also attending the webinar. It, you know, she's not among the panelists, but she's in the participants right now. Uh, so just broadly, like why climate justice and gender justice are often sort of you know linked with each other, and there's enough reasoning for that. And I don't think uh, you know we can actually negate uh how gender uh, transformative agenda or gender justice is so important to climate justice narratives 
because climate justice has existed for a long time in the climate negotiation space, climate policy space. Operationalization of climate justice hasn't been as smooth as one would imagine, but in terms of uh, the discourses around climate justice have existed for a long period of time. But uh, as we have moved on, of course, climate justice has also uh, taken upon itself new meanings and new dimensions and uh, new actors, uh, essentially, as you can see in this picture, how non-governmental actors and uh, trans uh, kind of, you know, trans uh, national actors have become a very important part of building this uh, discourse and uh, um, and agenda on gender justice. And as you know, this is one of the quotes that essentially talks about how climate injustice is so in, it's so it's uh, gendered and it's not just poor countries, it's in rich countries, it manifests in various ways in terms of, you know, different sectors like housing, transportation, food insecurity, and also in terms of the intersectional lens that we need to apply to this in terms of, you know, uh, uh, you know, how we cannot treat gender as a homogeneous group or women as a homogeneous group uh, in the sense that we also need to uh, take into consideration disability, uh, uh, class, uh, caste, race, and a whole, of, uh, a whole lot of other factors which also influence how, uh, how the gendered experiences within the space of climate really manifest itself. Um, and, and we also have to keep in mind that there are different ways of mainstreaming gender into climate or energy policy. So, of course, gender mainstreaming is also not a new concept, uh, especially UN and various other international organizations, regional organizations, and even national governments have put in place gender mainstreaming measures, which essentially means that we need to think about uh, or assess the implications for men and women of any planned action, whether it is legislation, policies, programs, and at all levels of governance. It's not just at the national level, but also at the, at the sub-national level or international level as well. So how these differentiated experiences and concerns can be integrated into design, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of policies is what gender mainstreaming essentially sort of represents in the policy domain. But there are different sort of ways of mainstreaming gender. So of course, we are moving slowly from a very gender blind or gender negative sort of you know, policies to understanding that we need to uh, you know, integrate gender into all policies. So yes, uh, of course, focusing on uh, equity that is like 50-50, like more like representation of men and women and you know, or marginalized targeted uh, populations to more gender responsive policies where you also address the differentiated needs of men and women and address the equitable distribution of benefits, resources, status, rights. But uh, when, when, we, when we talk about gender responsive as well, we do not really address the root causes of inequalities. We do not really go into uh, you know, uh, how the power structures and inequality, structural inequalities matter in daily lives, which also affect men and women very differently. And this is where gender transformative approach comes in, where, where, where we also have to think about you know, norms and cultural values and power structures and all these different elements which are the root causes of gender inequalities and discrimination. So essentially, we need like a systemic transformation and institutions need to transform themselves as well, where uh, these inequalities are created and maintained because of the power structures that essentially exist. Um, if we look at international or intergovernmental processes, uh, we have the gender action plan when it comes to uh, climate, uh, you know, uh, the climate arena in the UNFCCC, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. The Paris Agreement also acknowledges gender in a big way. So if we look at the history of gender mandates, I, uh, you know, it's, it's primarily sort of traced back to 2001, where the first decision was uh, made in, in relation to at least increasing the participation of women in the UNFCCC processes, if not beyond that. So from then on, uh, many decisions were taken. Uh, and I think the 2017 Gender Action Plan in that way was one of these landmark events or landmark developments which led to finally acknowledgement of gender as an agenda item, as, a, as an important issue within the UNFCCC process beyond just representation, beyond just making sure that there are enough women in all the committees and all the workshops and other things. But beyond that, how do we really transform uh, women's participation by recognizing their, uh, uh, you know, their role and their uh, needs in that sense? 
Uh, so there are various ways when we look at energy transitions. There are many, many issues that are embedded in this in this debate, right? So it's about access to energy and gender equality, for instance. You know, women are, have differentiated impacts even when it comes to, uh, you know, inequitable access to affordable energy. Um, and this also has to do with the fact that women engage in activities like cooking and, you know, collecting firewood and these kind of activities. And it also is, you know, beyond this, when we look at energy transitions uh, and, you know, when we look at uh, jobs uh, or just the, if you look at the labor market, again, where women engage in a lot of informal work, which is not recognized. Now, these are the inequalities that needs to be recognized when we talk about transitions. Now, that is why it is not just transition, it's transitions. It's a plural where we have to think about many transitions that need to happen simultaneously if we need the sort of climate justice that we are talking about. So that you can see like in terms of share of women in fossil fuel industry was 22%, is, is still remains very low, 22%. But even in the renewable energy jobs, it's still low, 32%, uh, although it's much better than the fossil fuel industry. So this kind of disproportionate sort of representation of women, uh, whether it is in the informal sector, like if you look up, look at the coal sector, again, most of the uh, women engaged in the coal sector are uh, doing informal work. So that's something that needs to be recognized as well if we are talking about just energy transition uh, uh, in, a, in a systematic way. Now, um, I mean, what is gender transformative energy transitions? Uh, as I mentioned, first and foremost, we have to recognize the importance of power in these in these dialogues. There is no way we can talk about gender responsive policy without understanding the root causes of these inequalities or changing the realities on the ground itself. But beyond that, what are the other factors which are often talked about, even within, for instance, the CSW, the, the Commission on Status of Women, and also International Labour Organization, all these different organizations have come up with their own guidelines as to how we can make this space more gender transformative. This includes, for instance, workplaces, how, how, uh, how represented are women and other marginalized communities within the labour market. This includes education sector as to how, how many women are there in STEM subjects, which is very critical to the whole renewable energy transition debate as well. How many women are trained and skilled? Now, it's not just the quantitative aspects, but it's also about how many women are able to even, uh, you know, uh, access these spaces where training and skilling happens. We have seen in that most of the trainings, uh, kind of programs and skilling programs, women are not able to get the access because again of you know the the kind of other uh, sort of structural inequalities they face or the kind of care work they have to engage in many other factors that kind of uh, disadvantage them within the sector in policy making again we can see that representation of women within political bureaucratic positions is very low in most of the countries including in the indo pacific region now this is again something that needs to be improved if we need more sort of you know inclusive ways of decision making at the top level and even you know at the other levels of decision making which is very important and then i think one of the factors which you would often find even in my research what i have found is that there is not enough gender disaggregated like uh, data you know so this is one of the main uh, obstacles that many agencies face even when they have to frame a policy based on these differentiated kind of you know impacts and uh, uh, other factors so it's and it is in terms of both fossil fuel and renewable energy sectors now in the indo pacific specifically uh, what i have seen is that most of the indo pacific strategies of course do not really recognize gender in a, in, a, in a big way. Now, this is one of the biggest challenges that needs to be rectified in a big way. Like even if we are talking about cooperation among countries or, or you know, even in terms of, you know, changing, I mean, uh, changing uh, national level policies. Now, one of the, I think one of the policies which I've seen about the HADR uh, policy, which was brought out by the Quad, specifically mentions gender and, you know, gender inclusive processes. Now, this could be like a formula which also needs to be applied to energy transitions and other policies which are being adopted at the Indo-Pacific, uh, uh, you know, level. Uh, the role of climate diplomacy, I think, is very critical in terms of facilitating communication between governmental, non-governmental actors and civil society uh, organizations, because already there is a lot of cooperation that is happening between countries or among the regional organizations on climate uh, through diplomatic channels. How can gender then be, uh, you know, integrated in a better fashion is something that also can be discussed further. 
um, institutional bureaucratic processes, I think, is very critical to how this evolves. But if it treats gender as gender mainstreaming as merely a technical activity, a box ticking exercise, where you know you uh, you organize a couple of workshops with all women and talk about gender, that doesn't really uh, translate into gender transformative policies. We need to understand this as a continuous process. It's not a technical sort of exercise where okay, this is an additional burden now that you know we need to take care of. Um, the role of regional frameworks in adopting an intersectional approach based on their respective experiences is also very critical. And of course, last but not the least, I think uh, the role of grassroots feminist and other mobilizations on the ground have already contributed a lot to some of these conversations. So there is a lot to learn from many of these uh, uh, from many of these experiences on the ground as well. So I think I'll stop there. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, I hope. To receive like questions and comments later on. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Jairam. And if I can just take a minute, I think when you talk about the intersection approach, what I find particularly interesting is that you talk about disability and caste as well, which is very often ignored on larger conversation. And this anyway is such an important topic. And thank you so much for highlighting this in our webinar and through your work. Thank you so much. Uh, now I'd like to move on to Dr. Triyanti. Uh, if I could request you to please uh, take over, and you have 10 minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Can you hear uh, me clearly and also see the slides? Yes, we can. Great. Yeah, so I'm very honored to be here. Thank you again for the invitation um, for me to speak in this very important webinar. Um, yeah, maybe a bit of disclaimer in throughout my presentation or my intervention, I would use the term of Asia Pacific in, uh, instead of Indo Pacific. I think we can get into so much discussion about what the difference are, etc, which we already have in our uh, own ESG Asia Pacific working group, but I think it's just important to see it at the bigger picture um, in this webinar, and of course we can discuss them later on as well uh, during the discussion uh, session. So yeah, so the starting narratives uh, of my intervention today is related to my work. So my work is related to climate and disaster risk of um, governance for achieving sustainability. Um, so it's, it's a pressing issue nowadays, especially in Asia Pacific region uh, about the compounding risks uh, in Asia Pacific region and its impact also to sustainable development goals. We all know that Asia Pacific region is the most prone region to climate and disaster risk. Uh, the region is also home to more than 60% of, of global population. It covers many diverse countries, culture and ecosystem, and all of which uh, face a multitude uh, of challenges. Uh, but what makes uh, the situation even more daunting is the compounding effect of, of disaster and climate risk which create a complex web of interconnected uh, problems. So climate change here stands as uh, at the forefront of the compounding risk, uh, rising temperatures, extreme weather events, and also sea level rise pose a severe threat to the vulnerable communities. And we are now experiencing a lot of uh, more disasters, um, including floods, droughts, and cyclones uh, in, in this region. So the year of 2022 is again a harsh reminder for us of a sobering fact that uh, our region faces a tremendous risk, uh, flooding in Bangladesh and India, typhoons in the Philippines, heat waves um, and floods uh, in, in, in Pakistan as well. Uh, so according to the report of the UNSCAP, uh, floods were the deadliest disaster accounting for 74.4% of the events uh, and 88.4% uh, of total global deaths. Um, so the causes is the entangled anthropogenic and also natural um, uh, changes. And these disasters does not happen overnight, but enforced by underlying vulnerabilities uh, due to declining ecosystem health, uh, social economic pressure, injustice, uh, poverty, political unrest and conflicts, and also weak governance. So that's the whole um, argument about the multi uh, risk approach and also the need of systemic risk approach. Um, so in terms of the connection with SDGs, so these compounding risks have a direct impact on the SDGs. Um, so of course, you all know that it, uh, SDGs encompass a broad range of interconnected goals, um, starting from eradicating poverty and hunger to ensure clean water uh, and affordable energy. 
However, achieving these goals becoming more and more challenging in the face of compounding risk. So let's uh, take a look at some specific example. Um, goal one, for example, aims to eradicate poverty, but because of climate change induced disaster, it pushed the community deeper into poverty and undermining efforts for, for achieving sustainable development goals. And also the same case with uh, end hunger. So goal number two, uh, more and more droughts and also extreme weather events uh, disrupt agricultural system and therefore exacerbating food security. Uh, and then another case that I found important to mention here, also goal number six, focuses on clean water and sanitation because of water uh, scarcity worsens um, the um, vulnerability of local communities as well to deal with these water-related uh, water challenges. So if we look at the current progress of SDGs achievement, so I include some of the figures here uh, that I took from the, the, the recent report on the Asia and the Pacific SDG progress in 2023, so very recent. It shows that uh, the region is really far away from achieving SDGs. So of course, there is an increasing effort and, and progress, but it has been very slow. And if you look, look in, into the, the current data, uh, we need actually 42 more years to achieve uh, all the goals that we promised to achieve. Um, there is also this figure of a different progress of each of the SDGs. I think what is most strike, striking is the progress of the um, goal number seven on affordable and clean energy and also industry innovation and infrastructure goal number nine really showcase how important development, economic development, infrastructure development for Asia Pacific region. Meanwhile, uh, the goal number 13 is very, very regressing. So if you can see also here, the, the red mark here showing that we don't have enough um, means to actually achieve uh, goal number 13 in terms of dealing with the climate uh, extreme impact and also in terms of climate mitigation. Um, yeah, so the argument here that we need really to see this risk uh, as a interconnected um, problems and we need integrated approach as well. So how to actually break the silos and also work together across sectors and disciplines, um, also with stakeholders like government, civil society, private sectors, and how we can actually enhance our governance uh, capacity uh, and um, explore also different modes of governance, different way to govern, because of course, Asia Pacific is having a very different context and situation compared to other regions because of the very well-known vulnerabilities, but also because of a rich culture um, and rich natural resources that we can actually uh, harness in terms of uh, uh, building governance strategies. So maybe the next slide is more about uh, my work uh, as a scholar. I didn't um, uh, submit any paper yet to your journal, but I think it would be interesting to explore also in the, in the next edition of your journal. So um, my research focuses on the lens uh, of environmental governance. The uh, focus is on Delta and coastal governance, climate adaptation, uh, and also ecosystem-based uh, approach. Maybe some of you know it as nature-based solution. Uh, there are different terms nowadays, so um, I think you can either use one of them. But the key point here is that um, nature-based solution is really about that we um, increase the health of ecosystem for the sake of human, but also in terms of um, nature as well. So maybe you've also heard about the rights of nature approach, etc. So I think it would be much more useful to use the, this term in order to advance our thinking on how we can um, uh, conserve uh, nature, not only for the sake of human, but also for our planet. Several research topics that I want to highlight here. So I study governance perspective on climate scenario and integrated assessment models. I think you know the work of IPCC, which is very much based on the natural science and economic perspective when they try to um, um, build this, uh, a climate scenario. It is very helpful, but uh, I think the critic here, so that's why I thought that our work at the Copernicus is important, is to ensure that there is this governance and policy perspective uh, incorporated in building these models, because as you have known, maybe these models is really about trying to find different policies that can help us advance our effort to achieve the, the climate goals. But, but we need a governance perspective. We need to see 
different type of uh, knowledge also from the live experience of the government and societal stakeholders as well to envision what kind of future that we want to live in the in the future and again i mentioned about nature-based solutions so together with kwan also with other colleagues from vietnam we're trying to see different way to see nature-based solutions so it's not about only uh, about ecosystem for example a lot of studies about mangroves but less studies when we talk about the upstream, upper stream and also midstream of delta so there is this topic of sediment enhancing strategies as one of the way to to um, enforce nature-based solution uh, another topic is about systemic disaster risk governance especially in my home country in indonesia uh, I think it fits very well with, with the um, topic that I presented before this, the background, the motivation, why I think this study is very important, is to see disaster risk event as uh, cumulative results of weak governance, politics, conflicts, etc., which is um, still a gap in knowledge. Because I think what is important when we talk about systemic thinking, it's very easy for uh, researcher and scholars to understand right but not easy for the government officers or um, practitioners to really try to explore and find best solution because everything is entangled complex etc so i think the next step is to understand how governments practitioners see systemic risks and how to deal with that and lastly it is very big topic but it encompasses all of the research uh, lenses that I mentioned here is about transdisciplinary science and collaboration. So I study and also use transdisciplinary science, meaning that we don't only sit in our table um, on, on our desk and doing our own research by ourselves, but really trying to connect with uh, societal stakeholders, understanding the problems, and also try to find a solution together. Uh, lastly, I wanted to, yeah, this is some highlights of my work, but I think you can you can see it on the website as well. Um, the last slide is about the Asia Pacific Working Group. Um, uh, I think, Rushal, you already mentioned about ESG in general. Uh, I wanted to introduce to you this working group. Um, I uh, initiate this together with also Paul Harris. And lately, I mean, nowadays we have more than 50 members, active and inactive, of course. So the aim of this working group is really to provide a platform for scholars from the Asia Pacific region or, or scholars doing work on the topic of Asia Pacific, uh, both within the ASG, ASG network, but also beyond. Um, and I think the narrative here is to give or offer regional Asia Pacific perspective to contribute to the development of future global ESG research agenda. So I include here also the very nice diagram, a science plan um, here, the blue uh, figure about how ESG kind of um, develop its framework to understand earth system challenges, uh, problematize and also find a solution. Uh, then we will try to give perspective from different cases um, from Asia Pacific. Uh, and lastly, I know that uh, IPC is also very much fo focusing on early career scholars, which is also the strategy of the working group. Why? Because we have more, well, we, they, uh, have more energy and also very motivated to actually think along, be more innovative in terms of breaking the system and, and breaking the silo, let's say. These are some of the uh, example of focus that we are currently looking at as a working group. So this uh, pie chart, uh, it fits very nicely with the story that uh, Danashri just mentioned. So most of the um, our members think that two research lenses or combination of two research lenses are very, very important to explore, especially in the Asia Pacific region is the justice and allocation and also uh, the democracy and power because there we, we experience a lot of challenges, but there are also opportunities when we look at, for example, self governance top top uh, top down and bottom up a combination of top down and bottom up approaches, etc. So I will leave it at that. And I'm looking forward to also get your feedback and input, maybe also to discuss further uh, during the discussion session. Back to you, Rochelle. Thank you so much, Dr. Triyanti. Firstly, for giving us another webinar topic, exploring Asia Pacific and Indo-Pacific and the various dimensions of that, which is very important. But on a more serious note, of course, like for highlighting how important action on sustainable development goals is necessary, as you point out in your presentation, we need 42 more years more to at the rate at which we are going 
to achieve these goals, which is which just highlights the dire situation, but also the need for action and also your work through your transdisciplinary approach involving societal stakeholders, which is so very important. So thank you so much for that. I'm sure our audience members have a lot of questions and we will come back to them. But for now, I would like to move on to Ms. Morrison from the Australia Institute. Uh, Ms. Morrison, over to you. You have 10 minutes. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Fantastic. I am going to actually try and go without slides. I've got a couple of maps and things if we want to look at them later, but um, I'd like to start by acknowledging country. In Australia, we live on colonised land that was never, sovereignty was never ceded by the Indigenous people here. I'm calling in from Ngunnawal, Ngambri country, um, but everywhere you are in Australia is stolen land. And so I just wanted to start by acknowledging that. Um, and what I'm contributing to the chat today is I'd like to talk about uh, deep sea mining in the Pacific, especially Australia's in, uh, interest in deep sea mining and how it might challenge our relationships in the Pacific um, to basically give us all a sense of the context of deep sea mining as it is currently um, and a bit of a sense of what to look out for as we go forward. Um, so I'm going to start by giving us an outline of uh, what we're deep sea mining for, why we're mining for it, um, and why we're interested in it now. Then I'll talk about where it's happening, um, some of the problems and tensions around deep sea mining, uh, Australians' position in the deep sea mining debate and in, in industry, um, and then about what might come next. Um, so any questions, pop them in the chat, but also happy to chat in the question section later. So uh, deep sea mining is basically a whole industry that's developing around the need for critical minerals, um, which will be part of our renewable energy transition, which is so important for addressing climate change. Um, these critical mi minerals are, include cobalt, manganese, nickel, zinc, copper, um, and they're really important for uh, critical renewable technologies like electric vehicles, solar panels, wind turbines, and batteries. Um, these are the technologies that are so important for our renewable energy future, um, and the critical minerals are necessary for them. Um, whether they are necessary from the deep sea or whether they can be found elsewhere is part of what I want us to start thinking about from this chat today and from my contribution to the journal as well. Um, but why we're interested in it now is actually that the uh, United Nations regulatory body, the International Seabed Authority, that is responsible for managing the deep sea resources in international waters, um, have just come to the end of a deliberation process that was kicked off by Nauru um, to expedite the licenses around deep sea mining. So that means that deep sea mining can go from explore, exploration phase to extraction phase, um, which is a really, really interesting uh, sort of inflection point in the deep sea mining uh, pr progression, the deep sea mining uh, context. Um, and that's why we're really interested in, it, interested in it now, because those rules are coming up within the next month. Um, so I'm anticipating that this debate and this area of research and interest is going to kick off in a huge way in the coming months. Um, and I want us all to be equipped with the information we need to have these discussions as much as we can. Um, so where is this deep sea mining predominantly happening? It's happening in the clarion Clipperton zone, which is in the Pacific Ocean. It's south of Hawaii. Um, it's five kilometres deep and it's 5,000 kilometres long. It's a huge, huge, vast uh, stretch of deep sea floor um, and it's full of things called polymetallic nodules. They're about the size of a potato and they're full of those critical minerals that we talked about, like cobalt, manganese, nickel, zinc and copper. Um, and as you can imagine, countries are flocking towards these deep sea resources um, to try and get their industries up and running as quickly as possible. Um, but when lots of people are fighting over common resources, we all know that things can go wrong. And there are a lot of concerns that have been arising around environment and governance. Um, I'm going to touch quickly on environment and then go deeply into the governance concerns. So some of the environmental concerns, we know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the surface of the ocean floor, um, which is a mind boggling fact, uh, but it's a really, really important one. Um, 
And things that we do know that are happening on the seafloor is that the resilience of these deep sea resources, of the, these deep sea ecosystems is really, really slow. Uh, they're so deep under the ocean surface that light doesn't get down. So there's small amounts of energy input and these ecosystems recover really, really slowly. Um, other things that happen with deep sea mining are sound impacts, which can in interfere with whales migration routes and other echolocation, um, other marine mammals that use echolocation to move. Uh, so those are some very, very concerning environmental impacts, but perhaps even more concerning are some of the governance issues that are arising around deep sea mining. So I am not going to comment on um, the sort of the, the, I'm not going to comment on Pacific Island nations' autonomy to use their resources and grow their economies in that way. That's not for me to have an opinion on. Um, but what I do want to comment about is the UN uh, International Seabed Authority and Australia. So the International Seabed Authority is the custodian and the regulator of the world's deep sea resources. Already when I say those things, I'm hoping that, that the cogs are turning and that you're kind of thinking that a custodian can't really be an impartial regulator and a regulator can't really be an impartial custodian. Um, there's a lot of civil society pushback on the International Seabed Authority and its capacity to act as both of these things. Um, and actually the executive, well, uh, the executives of the International Seabed Authority have been criticised for not being impartial. Um, earlier this year, Germany sent a letter to the International Seabed Authority um, suggesting that the executives weren't being impartial when it came to trying to push ahead with the deep sea mining licences and trying to advance the industry. Um, and the International Seabed Authority has been known for placing more emphasis on the economic benefits rhetoric than an environmental focus and so sort of focusing more on its role as a regulator than its role as a custodian. Um, so that's a kind of snapshot of the International Seabed Authority. Um, and I'll also give a quick snapshot of one of the major players in the deep sea mining boom, which is the Metals Company. Um, the Metals Company, formerly known as Deep Green, is a Canadian deep sea mining company um, that's sponsored by Nauru, Tonga and Kiribati and is set to become one of the first licensees under the new International Seabed Authority licenses. Um, a lot of its messaging towards its stakeholders sort of pits ocean deep sea mining against land mining and says like land mining is so terrible we know that land mining is bad but deep sea mining will solve all of our environmental concerns and it will help us solve climate change like win-win, let's, let's go ahead with it. Um, which as we have kind of alluded to, there's a lot of environmental concerns in, from what we do know and what we don't know is so much more than what we do know. Um, and maybe we'll get a chance to talk about this later. Um, and so one of the main things that is coming up when we think about the metals company and deep sea mining in general is this sort of greenwashing uh, rhetoric that's happening around saying black like, deep sea mining out of sight, out of mind, climate change, climate solutions, renewable energy, like this is the way forward, let's go. Um, and I think that that is, that there's, uh, the way that I think about it is they're sort of using the urgency of climate change and climate solutions to kind of squash the environmental concerns that are happening, um, which is a really, really dangerous thing. And we kind of know from past experience that, that rushing ahead with things that we don't know the environmental impact of can be bad, bad news. Um, so that's kind of the international lens. And now I'm just going to briefly touch on Australia's position in all of this. Um, I hope we all know that Australia has a pretty poor reputation for climate ambition um, and we've also got a poor reputation for resource exploitation in the Pacific. Uh, Australian company BHP released 70 million tonnes of untreated mining waste in the OK Teddy River in, the, in Papua New Guinea over the 30 years of its life. Um, and the Australian Secret Service spied on East Timor in the mid-2000s to inform negotiations on gas and oil fields in the Timor Gap. So Australia is 
can be quite nefarious in its international fossil fuel industry. Um, Australia is also one of the largest, one of the world's largest fossil fuel exporters. Um, and research that the Australian Institute did earlier this year found that the Australian government is subsidizing fossil fuels to a tune of about $11 billion per year, um, which is quite mind boggling when Australia is saying all of these amazing things about net zero and 43% emissions reduction and 2030 and net zero and all of these things. Um, there's a lot more to it than that. But Australia's position on deep sea mining is actually a little bit less clear. Um, the National Science Agency, CSIRO, is actually in a $1.5 million partnership with the metals company, the Canadian company I spoke about just earlier, who is poised to become one of the first um, deep sea mining companies. I don't want to give too much airtime to a $1.5 million partnership. It's not huge in the scope of Australia's international relations. Um, and the spokesperson for Ed Hussick, the Minister for Industry and Science, said that this partnership is at arm's length from government. So to the extent that Australia's government is related to these deep sea mining research, it's hard really to say, but there is a partnership there that does exist. On the other hand, um, the government's draft election profile, uh, draft election platform, which is public, uh, but it is a draft as a disclaimer, um, says that Labor, sorry, I'm going to read from my sheet right now. It says that Labor will ensure that the Australian government leads ambitious international efforts for global agreements on a moratorium on deep sea mining in international waters. So these two things kind of don't really add up. Um, and the other thing that is happening in Australia at the moment is that Australia talks all the time about its Pacific neighbours and our Pacific brothers and sisters. And we've made big claims in the last year of the new Labor government that Australia is going to take a bid to host COP31, which is a, U a UN climate conference in a few years' time in partnership with a Pacific Island nation. Um, the Pacific Island nations are divided in how they feel about deep sea mining. As I mentioned, Nauru, Tonga and Kiribati are sponsors of the metals company. And in their sort of rhetoric around the way they talk about it, they want to sort of claim the economic benefit of the industry and pursue their self-development goals. And so they should. That's totally within their rights. Other countries have called for a moratorium uh, because it's a little bit more align with their environmental values and their custodianship of the oceans and that kind of thing. And some other countries are more in between. They think that we should just hold off until we know a bit more. Um, so there's a wide spectrum of positions in the Pacific. Um, and I think Australia trying to host a UN climate conference with the Pacific Island nation, uh, who, the, who they choose to partner with in that sense is going to be a really, really interesting decision. And uh, as we talked about, Australia doesn't have a great reputation for environmental exploitation in the Pacific. Uh, this decision could really test those tensions with some of those Pacific island nations. I don't know what's going to happen next. I don't know who they'll choose. I don't know which side they're going to go with, sort of the pro-mining or the moratorium on mining. Um, but these are all the things that I see coming up in the next little while. Um, and it makes this space a really, really interesting um, area of study and area for attention for all of us. Um, so this month, when the International Seabed Authority releases its mining code and the first licenses are granted, I think we're going to see a huge influx of attention on deep sea mining. And that will kick off a lot of these discussions and these debates. Um, and one other thing that I just really want to touch on before we close up here is that this is one of the first instances that I know of where climate and environmental interests are kind of diverging, where in the past they've been really good allies um, in the movements to protect environment and nature and climate. So I think it's just going to be really fascinating is basically the, the, the crux of my talk. Um, but thank you so much for all of your time and thanks for tuning in. Um, and I'm keen to hopefully chat more in the question section. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Morrison. And thank you so much for demystifying 
I think deep sea mining, which remains shrouded in mystery and for breaking down several rhetorics which are coming out and understanding the real impact of this uh, issue. And I'm very excited to open the journal up in public source, which will be soon available on our website, which goes into more details about this. So thank you so much for that enlightening presentation. Uh, last but not the least, I would like to hand it over to Dr. Hong. And if I could request you to please uh, give your presentation, sir, you have 10 minutes. Thank you, everyone. That's on, uh, thank you so much for having joining the webinar today. I think the topic is really interesting and also very happy that we have uh, colleagues working across different disciplines. Um, also, very thanks, Anissa, for your kind introduction, introduction for me to, to this. And actually, this week is really <laughs> terrible for me, but I'm really happy to to join with you. Uh, okay, so my topic, actually, uh, if you see my screen, uh, can you see my screen now? Okay, good. Uh, yeah, so I'm trying to share with you a bit about what we are doing now about circular economy in Vietnam, and I'm um, trying to share with you what I'm thinking about there are some potential collaborations in the Indo or Asian Pacific regions in terms of sustainability. Okay, I will uh, skip a bit, uh, but um, there's just some slide here. First, I also want to say that our institute and the Vietnam National University, which is an um, um, eco-ministry university in Vietnam. So that's why we are not only work um, on research or uh, teaching undergraduate, graduate, but also have a strong mandate to support the country development in terms, especially on uh, policy recommendation or support. Our institute is um, uh, a peer based on the partnership uh, um, related um, between academy, uh, industries, governments, and other stakeholders. Uh, we are working on different aspects of circular economy, crossing uh, from uh, yeah, technology to policies, and also at uh, different scale, but we also have a strong mandate to, to link this circular economy in Vietnam and the world. Yeah, in terms of circular economy, we are working across different sectors, including a city industries, um, bioeconomy, which is also linked to agriculture, forestry, and food, and also a solution for uh, coastal uh, Iceland reasons, but also some emerging topics, especially plastic waste, renewable energy, and others. Yeah, I think I'm not going to give. Uh, to detail about circular economy, but to try to say that it is really a, a solution to deliver the decoupling between uh, economic and uh, environmental, uh, economic growth and environmental degradations. Uh, it's used based on the uh, concept of multi objective so that we can, apart from having uh, economic growth, but we also have some others, uh, including natural preservation, but also creates job market. Uh, and also other social effective. This is just a slide which I want to quote from Janice Potanix from just two weeks ago when we was in Henniski for the World Circle Economy Forum. He said the future will be circular, the future will be green, or there will be no futures. So um, yeah, you can see actually here the circular economy can address about and directly now over 17 sustainable development goals and others the goals that are indirect impacts. Uh, of course, there are uh, historical development of the circular economy, uh, but I think we also I want to mention, especially in the last column, there's strong linkage between circular economy with Asians, uh, um, Asian cultures, for example, the Buddhism or Taos, Ecologies. This is, I think, also very interesting uh, for Asian countries. I will also skip this, but I hear I think I also want to mention that uh, the circular economy can work across different scales. It can be from micro scale like company, but on be bigger like major scale, industrial part, for example, but also cross macro scale, which is from ranging from city, region, national, or international. So there are different uh, frameworks showing how circular economy can approach to different scales. That I mean. Okay, this is also very important because uh, we are now for, in the global agenda related to renewables, energy, or carbon neutralities. Uh, people are 
uh, study from Elon Musk is saying that you know, if we are looking at only uh, on renewable energy, it can take only about 55%. Other we can achieve through circular economy uh, solution. Uh, second part about circular economy development in Vietnam, this is already in the political agenda. First thing, we also have the law related to circular economy, uh, national circular economy plan, of course, different sectors from NATO resources, environments, to investment, planning, industry and trade, including energies, how circular economy can integrate in different uh, sectors, especially in agriculture. We also have some company leading into the uh, topic, but of course, there's still uh, quite some limitations. I mean, in, especially from S, uh, perspective from SMEs, small, medium size enterprises, they are still quite underdeveloped in terms of circular economy. Okay, then coming to some example, uh, this one we are looking at circular economy uh, uh, from agriculture. This is uh, a linkage between uh, in terms of nature-based solution, but also have uh, agriculture related to the livelihoods of the local people, but it can link to global issue in terms of climate change adaptations, but also uh, others uh, in terms of, for example, uh, carbon uh, credits and some other global uh, <clears throat> market. Another important one we also want to share is circular economy for Iceland, which is we just developed the plan and approved by the local government. You know, in Iceland Pacific, we have a lot of Icelands. How circular economy can have sustainable Iceland development is very important. We also have how to integrate circular economy in uh, provincial or regional master plans because their circular economy really to link uh, different sectors together. Another one is we're working is the living lab where we try to have a collaborative environments where we can develop solution, but together with different stakeholders uh, from research perspective, but also business perspective. Um, opportunities and also uh, policies from local uh, governments. Uh, this is study we are working on circular economy for just transition in uh, for plastic, looking at how plastic have been transferred from European country to Asia, including Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, Philippines, and how the just have been addressed uh, in, 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 in terms of plastic. Uh, yeah, I want to also to try to, um, to put up the several topic that I think uh, we can look at for, uh, in the Asian or Indo-Pacific reasons. Uh, first, also our coming conference on circular economy for green transition in Asian Pacific, uh, respectively from 14 to 15 September this year, in Ho Chi Minh cities, uh, where we try to combine with the Ho Chi Minh City Economic Forum, respectively about more than 1,500 people, uh, including global um, many countries to join Vietnam. And some other topic in this, uh, including just energy transition, carbon neutralities, uh, ocean plastic or green tourism, uh, the nexus of water, food, energy, biodiversity, for example, especially in the lower Mekong regions. Or there are some other existing initiatives, including the bio-circular green economy for Asian countries, or the circular economy, global trade, global circular inclusiveness, circular economy. Yeah, there is just some you know, there one that you can also see that, for example, the role, for example, with Australia in the Japan community in Asian Pacific and some of the Asian uh, program in terms of biocircular economy, uh, also other global uh, uh, initiative and also global issue that we, for example, we see the, the ocean plastic and the Asian or Indo-Pacific contribute quite a really big uh, uh, part of, of this plastic pollution. Okay, so I think that the uh, final talk, circular economy, uh, this is really up to date and holistic to uh, sustainability. It's multi objective and also multi sources or sectoral recreation. Uh, there are many issues can be addressed and also potential collaborations in the Indo-Pacific region. But of course, there are a lot of challenges ahead and we really need to partnership and solidarity towards the sustainable future of Vietnam of the Indo-Pacific region and world. Thank you very much and looking forward for the next uh, panel discussion with you all. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Hong. This was an extremely insightful and detailed presentation. And it was very interesting how you highlighted specifically the potential areas of cooperation and collaboration in this region, which is largely missing. So thank you so much for highlighting that. Uh, before we open up, the panel uh, or open up for a question and answer session. I will use my discretion as the moderator here to pose a few questions to our panelists. And I would request you to keep maybe your interventions to about two to three minutes so that we can, of course, interact with the audience members as well. I'll go back to Dr. Jairam. And uh, Dr. Jairam, during your presentation, you were specifically talking about climate diplomacy, uh, which was very interesting. If I can ask you to go into a bit of detail as to how you see climate diplomacy in this region helping attain gender transformative policies, which can have regional implications. How do you see that panning out? Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Rushali, for that question. Um, I think when I, when I said climate diplomacy, what I meant was there was already a lot of cooperation within the region, between countries, uh, through regional organizations, through sub-regional organizations on climate change, and to some extent, uh, you know, on energy as well. So these platforms can be essentially used. These are already like diplomatic channels and platforms built over a period of time with a lot of you know, a, attention being paid to the uh, problems and challenges being faced within the region. Uh, I mean, for instance, uh, in this region, you cannot think about energy transition uh, and climate action without linking it with development imperatives. You cannot. So, so, so these are the kind of challenges, these are the kind of issues that are embedded in the thinking, in the kind of strategies that countries uh, are talking about and countries are already sort of putting in place uh, in, of course, you know, cooperation with other countries. So that diplomatic sort of, uh, 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 you know, platforms can be leveraged further to integrate gender into the kind of policies that are being made or the kind of, you know, cross-country uh, collaborations that are being put in place. So that was what I meant. And it's also, it's also a, a it's also a creative way, for instance, for sharing information and you know learning the best experiences from different Uh, issues for a long time. So that includes civil society organizations, research institutions, uh, you know, transdisciplinary sort of uh, research networks, trans, you know, uh, border tra research networks who have been working on some of these issues who are also essentially, uh, you know, part of this diplomatic sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, this umbrella. So I think this kind of contributes further better understanding of uh, what, you know, what can be done, what needs to be avoided, how do we, you know, how do we uh, overcome some of these challenges, but at the same time, in terms of even developing capacities, developing technologies, uh, developing further solutions, uh, there is a role for diplomacy, which, which is something that we need to sort of, you know, further leverage upon and also build upon uh, in the future. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, Dr. Triandi, while we are on this question of the gendered response and the need for this gendered lens on this discussion, I'm curious if you see that there's a need for such a gendered lens when it comes to issues of uh, you know, governance in the governance of deltas and water management systems. Is it there? Do we need to achieve it? How can we go about it? What are your views on that? Um, yeah, I think it differs because like I said, especially when we talk about Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific, um, it encompasses different countries now, but in general, we need gender responsive approaches. Also in terms of Delta, I mean, the case of Delta is very clear because it's a, um, a very resourceful, resourceful area, very prone also in the same time, so many communities dependent on Deltas actually to live. Um, but yeah, the, your question about if it's already there, I think to some extent it is because the perspective is already there. Uh, people, uh, researcher, policymakers started to uh, be convinced that uh, gender uh, uh, responsive approach is needed, especially when we talk about resource allocation, participation of vulnerable communities. It includes also women, uh, children, um, disabilities. So there are different layers that we have to think about. And also when we talk about climate change impacts, for example, the impacts are actually uh, different. There's also inequalities of, of impacts when we, we talk about climate risk. Um, women particularly is more vulnerable because in the system, they're already quite 
uh, in, in, in how do you call it, in less prioritized um, area, let's say. Therefore, um, it is very needed to, to think about a specific approach to leverage their capacity. And also another thing is when we talk about um, their contribution to livelihood, like I said, like Delta is a very resourceful uh, area. People are depending on Deltas and women are really crucial in terms of building livelihoods uh, in Deltas. However, their voice is actually less heard, especially in the, in the context of countries where uh, power of men in the household is like very, uh, how do you call it, very powerful um, compared to, to women uh, and girls. So in that sense, I think the next step really to to kind of leverage this um, agenda further, as, especially in policy making. Um, there's always an issue about not just only recognizing, but also how to use the voice contribution of women who are actually experiencing the like in the real life the inequalities impact of climate change in order to make sure that the policy would work uh, maybe that's uh, my my answer to your question thank you so much for that uh Ms. Morrison, uh if i could ask you about uh when it comes to deep sea mining and you're talking about how the effects, the environmental impact of the same is still unknown, which is extremely scary, of course. But how do you see the need for these developing countries in the Indo-Pacific region? How can they balance this imperative of economic development while keeping in mind the environmental impacts of something like deep sea mining? Is this, is this balance attainable at all? Mm, it's interesting that you... Uh, called, so you sort of speak about it in terms of the ec economic balance. And, you know, I think valuing everything in an economic sense cannot achieve balance. I, I think that by looking through things in that kind of single lens negates the, the possibility for balance because there's always going to be trade-offs and there's always going to be a cost-benefit analysis that provides one thing over another. And I think... Um, Yes, these Pacific Island nations deserve every opportunity to grow their economies and to have agency over their economies and to build sustainable wealth and, and to grow towards their sustainable development goals. And I, I think absolutely yes, yes, yes to all of the opportunities that they can have to those things. Um, and I also think that you can't reasonably quantify everything in economic terms and especially things like deep sea environments that we know almost nothing about um i think achieving balance means looking beyond economics and looking at the value of everything sort of more holistically um and sort of as i as i've alluded to earlier this this is a sort of inflection point between climate and environmental interests and those movements and those civil society movements especially have been so so they've played really well together in the past and I think this is a this is a possible time when they might diverge and in that circumstance given that the pressure might diffuse a little bit between those movements I think it's even more important for decision makers to be taking those environmental values and those climate values into the equation as well as economics. Thank you so much. That is indeed a very interesting and much needed perspective. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Hong, I want to draw on your expertise of working on sustainable innovation, and you've uh, worked a lot on that, and you even spoke about it during our presentation. If I can ask you to go into a bit more details as to what do you see the current scope of sustainable innovation um, in this region, or maybe the current trajectories of these developments, and what role do you see for sustainable innovation in driving um, the sort of even climate action or action on sustainable development in this region? What role do you see for, for innovation in this? Yeah, thanks, Anna. Uh, I think this is really a really interesting uh, question. And actually in circular economy, uh, we have uh, also um, uh, a, a top of our pillar or the topic working on um, innovation in circular economy and especially innovation uh, business models. Um, the, I think this is a really a uh, very important one. Innovation here is is um, is crossing uh, different uh, 
area is not only related to innovation in uh, technology, but the innovation or social innovations or rural innovation, how innovation can address the uh, different um, aspects of uh, of the business or of the societies. In, uh, um, and this actually also creates a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, space for entrepreneurs. Because let me, let's just back to one of my slides related to the current awareness or readiness in circular economy. Actually, it's really quite slow. And actually, we see the transition or the transformation speed among those enterprises into green uh, business is still really a challenge. So actually, uh, apart from innovation solution that can help those uh, company, but I think the innovation is very important to uh, our space for entrepreneurs. They, 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 they need those solution uh, to, um, to, to have the, the existing um, enterprise or industries. And um, Another th thing related to circular um, in innovation is um, how, because you know, uh, uh, we are talking about circular economy. It is really like a multi objective or multi purpose solution. Uh, and it's not really in a regular thinking. So, actually, find out how the multiple objective can be addressed. It's really need uh, innovative uh, solutions. Uh, yeah, so it's, I mean, it also can come also to different levels. We can come to the farmers, we come to the factories to see how innovation uh, can, can arrest their direct business. But this innovation can also go to, to, to the bigger scale. Let him, let him mention again, the industry scale or um, governments or reason, I mean, in terms of administrations or um, management at the province or cities and reason. This kind of innovation is, is much to look to, we need to look at a little of very. Key, uh, I, I think it's really a key solution uh, towards sustainable. Of course, together with social, I mean, to go into science technology, but uh, yeah. So again, here, I mean, we have to go back again to to the roles of, of the universities. It need to be uh, not only research oriented, but really need to be innovation. I mean, in terms of uh, direct impacts, uh, more, more, more impact, uh, full or more direct impact to societies. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Uh, this is the extent to which I utilize my privilege as a moderator. And now I will open up to the question and answer sessions. As indicated in the chat, please feel free to drop it, drop your questions on the chat box or raise your hands. And I will request you to unmute yourself, give a very brief introduction and direct on, and direct your question to whichever panelist or indicate if it's a question for the entire panel. Um, we do have about 10 minutes. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time. But uh, we would be happy to also take your questions over email and direct it to our panelists. But for now, if there are any questions, I request you to use the chat box or raise your hands, please. Um, are there any questions? I do see one raised hand, uh, which is from Amba. If I can request Amba to please uh, unmute herself and ask the question. Uh, hi. Uh, I'd like to ask this question uh, to Ms. Morrison. Um, how can decision makers balance the potential economic benefits of deep sea mining with the need to protect the unique marine ecosystems and biodiversity of the Pacific Islands? Yeah, I think it's I think it's a really hard. Um, thing to do and I think the it, it comes down to individual nations and and their decisions about um where they place their value whether it's on their economic and sustainable development or whether it's on the protection of their biodiversity I think um when it comes to international resources 
and the regulation of our sort of shared resources in the international waters. Uh, that comes to the United Nations International Seabed Authority, which is the agency I kind of uh, gave a bit of an outline of earlier. Um, I would like to see the United Nations International Seabed Authority put equal weight on environmental protection and its conservation values uh, as it does on the sort of economic benefits rhetoric that it has been um, focusing on recently, especially given that the whole world has agreed just a couple of months ago on the High Seas Treaty to protect 30% of the oceans by 2030. Uh, it, this does not apply to the Clarion Clipperton zone. They have not extended the 30% to cover that area. Um, you can kind of imagine why, but I think there's no there's no denying that the world is coming finally to agreements that conservation is so important. Um, and I think as well, given the sort of 2030 uh, target of that, um, we, need, we know the year 2030 is a benchmark really well. It's used all through climate uh, talks as well. Um, so I think it's really nice to see the environment movement achieve a really solid 2030 goal as well to kind of put that urgency on environmental issues as well as climate issues because um, I think there was a bit of a risk of uh, climate getting all of the urgency and all of the impetus and then deep sea mining and other sort of dangerous industries going ahead without the environmental urgency also um, alongside them. Um, this is a long-winded, convoluted answer to your question. It's probably not an answer to your question, um, but I think I, I would like to see more balance and I would like to see um, economics become a sort of side consideration to the bigger considerations of climate and environmental values. Muted, I'm so sorry, I just realized I was on mute. Um, yes, thank you so much for that, Ms. Morrison, and thank you for your question. Um, do I, if there are any other questions, please, I encourage you to use the chat box or raise your hands. I do not see them as of now. I do see Dr. Jairam. Uh, if I could request you, please go ahead. Yeah, I have a question for Anisa, actually, if that's okay. Uh, I mean, she spoke about nature-based solutions. And I think, uh, you know, this is such a critical debate right now, even in the climate negotiations. Like, there's a lot of, you know, I mean, the whole topic is so politicized now. Like, what, what does nature-based solutions constitute? How do we... How do we go about investing in nature-based solutions for, I mean, there's also this confusion between nature-based solutions, ecosystems-based adaptation, uh, how much of it contributes to mitigation, how much of it is for adaptation. So I, I was just wondering, also developing countries are very divided when it comes to, uh, you know, kind of uh, acknowledging the role of uh, uh, nature-based solutions as well, especially even when it comes to the, you know, IPCC report, for instance, when it actually talked about promoting or, uh, you know, uh, kind of investing more in nature-based solutions. So I was wondering, like, from your research around the politics around it, um, and how do policymakers really engage in these discussions at, you know, at the national level? Uh, and also, how do they go about implementing these solutions? You know, how, uh, about who's really included in these processes, who are excluded, which is also a major problem. And also, like, there's a lot of greenwashing that is also associated with nature-based solutions, which is also a problem, uh, I guess. So I was, I, you know, I just wanted your views on this uh, from, you know, your research uh, in the, the countries that you specified or otherwise, yeah. Yes. Can, can I answer that, Trishali? Thanks a lot for your question, Nanashri. I mean, I somehow kind of implicitly addressed it in my presentation, but because it's only 10 minutes, I couldn't problematize it enough. But I think you're right. I mean, NBS, nature-based solution, is now very much, you know, the sexy term, everyone using it. But I think people are kind of forgetting what's the use of that concept. You know, it's about connecting back to nature, basically. But of course, there are opportunities, both opportunities and challenges. Opportunities is, of course, you remind people, right, that, that we need to connect with nature. It's good in terms of policy language because you try to convince people, hey, 
do more investment. Uh, this is the term that we use. It's kind of endorsed by you know global um, frameworks, etc. IPCC, UN, UNDR, whatever you name it. But I think yeah, again, people forgot that, especially in developing countries, we already doing a lot of nature-based solution even without the concept. Um, Talking about indigenous community, for example, conserving their land, you know, without actually having in, to deal with this political uh, debate in the UN, they're already doing it. Uh, so I think there are also a lot of more kind of tendency towards uh, promoting it as a hybrid kind of approach or so combination between nature and engineering approach, which in some cases are needed, especially if you need such approach to uh, avoid your land to be sinking. Like, I mean, in capital city, like for example, in Jakarta or other big city, but then um, it's sort of like driven away from the whole narratives of connecting back to nature. It, it is more about international development agencies trying to put more investment and in finance, uh, exporting knowledge about this hybrid technocratic solution more than a nature-based solution in its essence, let's say. I think we have to be very careful, especially looking into the colonization perspectives, um, how to decolonize, uh, de decolonize this thinking of going back to nature without thinking about, you know, making more money. You know, it really, really push us away from the essence of us as part of the nature. It's about us kind of imposing our effort or our I don't know measures to to nature for only our own sake of benefit uh, I don't have the uh, maybe it's not an answer to your question then it is more like problematizing uh, the, the issue I saw also Kwan uh, raise his hand thank you so much Dr. Shanti Dr. Hong if I could request you to please yeah, no, I, I think I just want to 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 add a bit on on nature based solution. I think it was really like people look at nature based solution as um, a kind of, for example, ecosystem conservation, preservation in more or less rural or coastal areas. But I think it's now become also very uh, important to have more nature based solution in the cities, even where we have even less uh, lands in the in the cities. But if we can, uh, let's say, design the cities uh, uh, more innovative, or uh, we can even include the nature-based solution in the city because it really creates really multiple benefits to the cities because we see there are really a lot of stressful in for people living in the cities in terms of uh, hit, uh, urban heat islands or air pollution and we really need the green or blue space in the cities but of course we have to go it together with business models so actually what we also try now to do in vietnam uh, and just one another important thing because uh, we like Vietnam or maybe some other country we are in committed to uh, neutral carbon carbon neutrality in the coming years, like twenty uh, fifties. If we don't really have solutions for the cities, including green space development, I think it's hardly to achieve the this um, uh, objective. Yeah, just more than two to it. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Hong. Uh, this does bring us close to the end of our uh, uh, question and answer session. Uh, once again, if you have any question, maybe we have time for one more question of the moderators. Uh, sorry, if the panelists would allow it. Uh, just another, if there's any other questions. Um, I, have, I have a question from uh, Shadman Sharar, who is directing it to Dr. Hong, which is how does a circular economic model which emphasizes sustainability and reusability of resources reconcile with the demographic and economic trajectory of the Indo-Pacific region, which indicates greater demand for goods and services in the future among its people. Um, yeah, thank you so much. It is Samen Sarah. Um, uh, I think I'll... Yeah, I, um, circular economy uh, in terms of um, resources, of course, there are, uh, uh, there, there are many different uh, principles of circular economy, including uh, reuse uh, of, of resources, but also uh, how we can utilize 
more uh, green or bio-based um, uh, resources or to, to, to be less uh, fossil uh, resources. Yeah, of course, this can include uh, the, uh, I, I mentioned it's a circular business model you also already mentioned. Actually, it needs to be really uh, context specific. Uh, of different uh, uh, from different scale I already mentioned but in terms of Indo-Pacific reasons I think we can also look at it uh, from uh, a kind of uh, integration of different um, uh, uh, um, uh, solution uh, together like I mentioned there is in the lower Mekong region we can combine the aspect of uh, energy food waters biodiversity um, but also, for example, in energy related, we can have, for example, uh, recently we have a, a partnership between Vietnam and Singapore where Vietnam can create a lot of renewable energy and convert it into hydrogen and then export it into uh, Singapore for for for. Or for using there, yeah. But I think also there are some other similar initiative for, uh, from Australia. I think also very strong in uh, renewable energy or hydrogen. Um, yeah. So I think uh, of course we always have to reconcile with the demography and ec economic trajectory. But of course I think we still need um, uh, let's say um, institutionalize those into practice especially looking at the Asian Pacific or Indo-Pacific or Asian countries, how this can put into the agenda of, uh, of, the, of the countries, uh, political, of those countries and institutionalize it uh, because actually translates those into, into institutions. Um, uh, uh, it is really still um, a big challenge. So because, but I think there are already some existing um, manners that we can also look at, especially looking at the uh, a, a trade agreement among those countries and then how global North South can work together to uh, support those country in in the kind of transitioning because um, the uh, so countries still a bit developed, but some models of how can have its others. I think it's also very um, important. One I also mentioned in my last slide, for example, that we have been working with people in inclusive circular economy in at the global um, at the global scales, and this is led by the Chatham House and some others. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hong. This does bring us to the close of our uh, webinar today. I take this opportunity to thank all our panelists for taking time out for joining us, for sharing their very, very valuable insights. And the very fact that I think uh, the presentations have left us thinking and they've raised more questions in our head uh, than answers is sign of just how, how, uh, how enlightening and how intellectually stimulating this webinar was. So thank you so much for taking the time out for joining us today. Thank you so much to the audience members for, their, for patiently uh, being a part of this webinar for asking these interesting questions. And last but not the least, I would like to thank Team EESG. We have Camille with us, we have Jane with us, and thank you so much for being so supportive throughout the process and for the wonderful work that you are doing. Uh, finally, I will take a minute to also thank our contributors for the Indo-Pacific Journal's upcoming edition, uh, which will be released soon. It will be on our website. We will be sharing it um, on our social media channels as well as over email for all those who subscribed to us. Um, so please uh, be on a lookout for that. Firstly, of course, Dr. Jayaram and uh, Purnika Bhattacharya for, your, for the very interesting uh, expert commentary as well as Ms. Morrison. We also have contributions from Marufa Akhtar and Subeta Farooz. We have a contribution from Uja Tapan. We have a contribution from Dr. Varki and Dr. Shafuan Charizard. And uh, we also have a contribution from Shui Yi. I will not reveal more details as to what the papers are, but I can assure you that they're extremely interesting and worth your time and effort. We will be sharing that with you. Um, so once again, thank you so much to our panelists. We will stay in touch. And for our audience members, if you have more questions, which unfortunately we could not address due to the time limitations, please feel free to reach out to us. I will be sharing the email over chat here and we will direct it to the panelists. And of course, the panelists, I would request you to address them uh, if we receive them and we will communicate it back to the members. Thank you once again. Thank you so much. It was an honor to host all of you. We look forward to your continued participation. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good thank weekend you. to all. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Nice weekend. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.